the board for kind of pre-class, everybody's late kind of questions here. Give ourselves maybe four minutes. This is open book. This is open partner. Talk to each other. Uh, basically, we're just trying to remember what happened in chapter seven or what, sh- what was in chapter seven. And I've given you some verse breakdowns for the vision just to make sure we get the various details that were listed. Need to go. So like I said, take a few minutes to remind yourself and jot down The highlights from chapter 7 of Daniel. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about it. Uh, Hopefully you had a chance at least to uh, get the juices flowing or to get some of the highlights from the vision. Um, Let's go through here. First six verses of Daniel chapter 7. What does Daniel see in his vision? Four beasts. Great. Uh, anybody want to try to name all four of them? Basic figure. First one is a lion, bear, leopard, and a scary, terrible beast. Okay, and there's more said about that fourth beast in verses seven and eight. And um, what is that? What are some of the things we learn? Details about the fourth beast. He devours, uh, maybe even more so, more violent than the others. What else? Ten horns, I think I heard someone say that. And iron teeth. So let's go with the ten horns, and then after the ten horns, yeah, there's three that kind of give way to one little one, okay? And that little one, it says, is uh, loud and boastful, Okay. So there's more detail about that fourth beast, okay? It's the scariest of all, but it also has these horns, one of which kind of, you know, shows itself as the end as the most, um, at least, prideful um, of those horns, okay? And then what happens in, what does Daniel see, I should say, in verses 9 to 14? What does he see after the raging, violent beasts fighting each other? Thrones, Ancient of Days, who is God, okay, Uh, just another way to refer to God the Father on His throne, and you see the difference, right, between the chaos and the warring of the beasts, and then the uh, authority and the serenity, transcendence of the Ancient of Days, and then what transpires after Daniel sees the Ancient of Days, The beasts are killed, and there's one more thing that he sees before the vision's over. One like the Son of Man, uh, ex- exalted in heaven who receives, uh, receives dominion. Okay, um, So this is kind of um, you know, how things end, or, or how things resolve themselves right uh, after the, uh, the raging of the beasts. All right, so that's the vision. What's the interpretation? Again, give me in short, summary, brief, highlights. What's the interpretation of all this crazy stuff that Daniel sees? Four kingdoms on earth? What about the horns and the little horn and all that? Of the fourth beast? If the four beasts are four kingdoms, the ten kingdoms, uh, horns are ten kings or rulers, and the little horn is kind of special about him at the end. He is a particular ruler who will do what? Daniel learns. What will the little horn do uh, by the end of uh, what Daniel hears? This one king that comes at the end of the fourth kingdom. Persecute the saints, okay? Um, But ultimately, what's the end of what Daniel's assured? Even with that persecution, even with that suffering, what, what is the end of the story as Daniel is told? God prevails. 
and the saints receive the kingdom. Remember, that's, what, that's actually emphasized multiple times. It's not just that God wins. Of course, he does. Um, and it's not even just that the one like the Son of Man, who we know is this messianic you know, figure, uh, not even just the, that the Messiah reigns and rules. The, multiple times, what Daniel's assured of is the saints reign and rule. They receive the kingdom, okay? uh, and they have the victory. Okay? All right, so that's chapter 7, and I do all that for a reason uh, that we'll see in just a second. But we are in the book of Daniel, you haven't figured that out. And tonight we are moving on into Daniel chapter 8, another a uh, set of uh, visions, or another vision in this set of visions that closes out the second half of Daniel. So this is what I want to do. I want to read the whole thing, read all of Daniel chapter 8. It's actually one of the shorter chapters in the book, uh, but it'll take us a few minutes to read all of Daniel chapter 8. And um, I didn't know whether to ask you before or after, but I'll ask you before so you can be thinking about it, maybe even jotting down, because there's space for both of these on your handout. I want us to do some compare and contrasting throughout this class with what we've just seen uh, in chapter 7 and talked about last week. So we're going to read Daniel chapter 8, and it is going to be your job, um, and we'll talk about it after we read the chapter. What are all the things you see that are similar to chapter 7? And then what are all the things you see as are different from chapter 7? But let's read Daniel chapter 8, and then you're going to have some time to talk about it with those that you're sitting near. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 1. Daniel says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the capital, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was in the, at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram. Standing on the bank of the canal, it had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue him from, rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal. And he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some stars, some of the stars, it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it, together with the regular burnt offering, because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host? To be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Verse 15 When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, 
These are the kings of Media and Persia, and the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cease, sorry, he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall, be, he shall destroy many. He shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. But seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Okay, uh, I'll give you five minutes at least to talk with those around you. Now, let me give you a halfway mark warning so you can move on to the differences if you're still on the similarities. But try to come up with as many similarities as you can to chapter 7, and then move on and come up with as many differences as you can uh, between chapter 8 and chapter 7. Talk about it with those around you, and we'll reconvene here in a few minutes. Okay. Do you have a question, Patty? Too late. Oh, there you go. All right. Um, what we're going to do, we're actually not going to share out these answers uh, all at one time now, um, but as we go through the text and talk about the ram, the goat, and the little horn, I want you to share out some things as they are relevant that you found. And then uh, assuming we get there uh, with the thought questions we have uh, on the back side of the handout at the end of class, I think there'll be an opportunity to talk about similarities and differences there as well. Uh, so let's work through the chart that you have uh, on the bottom of the front side of your handout. Um, and uh, just to place ourselves, you notice in verse one, it says that this is the third year of Belshazzar. So we're just a couple years uh, ahead of where we were um, in chapter 7, which was the first year of Belshazzar. So chapter 7, that vision was seen by Daniel two years prior to the vision he sees in chapter 8. So understand Daniel has already seen chapter 7. Uh, it's also interesting to note that we're still, we're again, back in the time of the Babylonians. What Daniel's seeing has to do with what's coming after the Babylonians. So can I keep that interesting uh, context in mind. Daniel is seeing glimpses of kingdoms yet to come while Babylon is still the world power, and this is what their empire would have looked like. And I'll show you some maps of the other empires as we go. They're all going to look the exact same. It's just the lines and colors are different. That's world history in a nutshell. The only thing that changes is the colors and the lines. Uh, everything else stays the same. So, Babylonian Empire here, you see it stretching across the Fertile Crescent, as it's called. Uh, you do see that the, the Medes and the Persians exist at this time, but they are they're just not as powerful as Babylon is, and uh, Persia is especially kind of small and just a part of the uh, empire of the Medes. Uh, but you see Babylon having taken over uh, Israel, of course. We talked about that in, in several classes recently, all the way to the border of Egypt. Egypt has been subdued, if not necessarily conquered totally by Babylon. They are at least uh, subject. Okay. So this is, uh, this is what the world map looks like when Daniel is seeing this vision. And the vision, I guess, looks something like this. See the uh, ram there on the left with the two horns of a ram. And then the goats not even touching the ground on the left side there with the one conspicuous horn doing battle against the ram. Okay. So what we'll do is, you see uh, on there that uh, there's information to be gathered about each of these components, these three main components from the vision Daniel sees. There's information there. There's information in the interpretation that he's told. This is what this means. And then there's some things we know just from world history and know about these kingdoms and these kings, and we can throw in things that are relevant there as well. So I want to hear from you first with each of these sections or each of these uh, components and then I'll throw a few things up on the board if we haven't already touched on them. But what do we know about the ram? This is the first of the, uh, the two animals. What do we know about the ram from, uh, from the vision and from the interpretation? A 
aggressive, Albert says. Okay, so Michelle says it's going west, north, and south. So we could assume that it's coming from what direction? East, okay? So it's from the east. Um, and in fact, we're actually told who this uh, animal is, right? Again, we can use all the information available to us. The ram represents the Medo-Persians, right? The Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, we're told. Uh, in verse 20, okay? Uh, other things we know about this Persian ram with two horns. Okay, one horn is bigger than the other. Anybody want to take a guess at what that... Maybe it doesn't mean anything. Maybe it's just... Okay, so there seems to be two, within the one kingdom, there's kind of two elements here, uh, or two, uh, two groups perhaps, one stronger than the other, okay? Anybody in your conversation connect this back to anything in chapter 7? Does anybody come up? Okay, we can come back to it. Other things we know about the ram, the Persian ram here. Yeah, the phrase is used that no one can stand before him. And so uh, it's the, Albert said aggressive, right? Aggressive and unstoppable. Okay? Um, and if you remember anything, which may not be much, it's okay, about the Persian Empire from world history. I mean, we're talking about an empire that uh, is around for 200 years. Okay? Uh, the, the book of Daniel, is the Bible is great at doing this, you know, summarizes 200 years of history in just a sentence, right? That he, no one could stand before him. That's, that's it. That's the Persian Empire. It was around for 200 years at its, uh, at its height, and it was unstoppable, and it was beating everybody, um, and it was, was strong and expanded, okay? Uh, what's interesting is that Daniel, it says in verse 2, he was in Susa. Now, uh, the question is, was he actually in Susa when he saw this vision, right? Like Ezekiel was at the river Kabar when he saw the vision in Ezekiel chapter 1? Or in, is it more like Ezekiel was taken in a vision to Jerusalem and Daniel is taken in a vision to Susa? The reason it, it's significant is because Susa will become, uh, in the days of the Persian Empire, the capital city of Susa. Um, in the days of Babylon, it's just a city in an outlying province of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, but this is maybe a little bit of foreshadowing of the coming Persian Empire uh, rams are uh, fairly common in the symbolism of, um, of ancient Persia. In fact, I found a chart today that breaks down the symbols you might find in a Persian rug. And there's lots of different ways of depicting the ram's horn. That's a symbol that uh, um, has long been associated with strength in Persian culture. Okay? So uh, there's maybe a reason for that. The theory uh, is that the two horns, one larger than the other, is the fact that this is the empire of the Medes and the Persians. As I showed you on the map earlier, initially the Persians are, are not as strong as the Medes, but eventually we don't even really remember the Medes. Right? In world history, you probably just learned about the Persian Empire. Okay? The Persians become stronger uh, and, uh, and you know, the bigger force in the, in the empire. Maybe that's what that means. And by the way, uh, if you connect back to, if this is connected in chapter 7, remember that the bear, which was the second of the four beasts in chapter 7, was raised up on one side. So that may be connected to the two horns, one larger than the other. We already mentioned it's coming from the east, and we've already read in the book of Daniel, back in chapter 5, that the Persians, uh, in the year 539, uh, the night that Belshazzar was having his great feast, were, uh, they, they were overthrown by the Persians. And uh, Darius the Mede received the kingdom, chapter 5, verse 31. Okay, anything else you want to say about the ram? Okay, this is what the Persian Empire looked like. Um, again, same map, okay, but now it's orange or yellow or mustard or something. Um, but that's the extent of the Persian Empire. You see the city of Susa there, the end of the royal road, um, and the capital city of Persia at its height. And um, 
So we keep going. What about the goat? What do you want to say about the goat in uh, Daniel chapter 8? Again, from the vision that he sees uh, at first, or from the interpretation that he's told later on in the chapter. Um, and then maybe we'll have some things to say about world history. Alexander the Great. That's not in the text, Terry. You're adding things in here. Okay. Um, how do we know that Alexander the Great is being uh, explicitly talked about in this vision, this chapter? We are told, we are told it's the Grecians, okay? And we're told that the big horn, the conspicuous horn, is the first king of the Greeks, who in fact was Alexander the Great. What do you remember about Alexander the Great? If, if any, anybody in this, uh, any historical figure in this class, you probably maybe remember some things about him. What do you remember about him? Well, that's a, what do you mean contributions? I love it. You just you just don't say anything for a while and just you know keep. No, Albert's exactly right. Um, well, I'll try not to say too much about this. But we're, now we're coming from the other direction. So we're told in verse 21 it's the Greeks. And in the, in the vision, the, the goat with the horn comes from the west. Um, and that's, that's fairly significant. Like, changes the course of world history. I mean, the, the whole fact that we probably all took a class at some point called Western Civ. Okay? The whole reason we talk about Western civilization is because of Alexander the Great. This is the point where west comes in contact with east. The Greeks come in contact with the Persians. West meets East, and West wins. Okay? Um, obviously, we have a certain vantage point. Uh, I don't know if the other half of the world is necessarily studying Western Civ, but, uh, but you get the idea, right? This is, a, this is a big turning point. It will become significant. And as Albert mentioned, what that means is the introduction of language and culture uh, from the Greeks to this whole region. So Greek then becomes the, the kind of predominant language that's spoken, um, uh, at least, you know, cross-culturally. We've talked about that with Aramaic a little bit. Greek becomes the new universal language. Um, I will say that Alexander was not necessarily just interested in making everybody else Greek. He was most interested in blending cultures and kind of borrowing from the various, uh, you know, uh, positive things or, or important things from every culture. He had a bunch of his men marry a bunch of Persian women at one point, kind of mass mar marriage ceremony as a way to show the merging of these two cultures and merging of these worlds. Um, but he was, he was some, someone interested in culture and science and language and learning. And uh, the result of his conquest is, is the, the spreading of what's called Hellenization, that's Greek culture, uh, across this whole region. Okay, I'm done with that. Um, other things you want to say about the goat, about uh, the, the Alexander the Great and the depiction in this, Vision. How is how how is the goat depicted? He's very great. Similarly, undefeated. What else is kind of highlighted about the goat? Strong, large horn. Why does it say his feet are not on the ground? It's like a levitating goat here. What's the, what's the significance of saying that he moved, uh, you know, in towards the ram, his feet were not even on the ground? The speed, I think, is what it is, uh, Mike. Someone I uh, was listening today compared to, like, Roadrunner, right? This, this is the image, right, of Alexander the Great. Um, and so he's fast, he's strong, and yet what is the, it even says it's in the vision. What does the text say? He's exceedingly great, but, yeah, when was it broken? It, I think mentioned, or is alluding to the fact in verse 8, that it's really broken at the height of his power. You may remember something like this, not the specifics, I'm sure, but the general idea. Um, this is the story of Alexander the Great. By the time he's 20, he's king of his father's kingdom, Philip of Macedon. Uh, he becomes king of Macedonia at 20. 
By 25, remember, remember BC stands for backwards counting, so you're sub- subtracting here. Uh, by 25 in 330, uh, 331, he's defeated the Persians in a couple, of mul- uh, a couple of major battles. Um, so he's expanded his kingdom across the whole region within, what, five years? And then eight years later, he's dead at 33. Okay. Um, so this is the story of Alexander the Great. He is uh, all, very powerful, very quick to conquer the entire world. And then he's dead before you know it. Okay? Um, and that's the picture of the goat and the horn in Daniel chapter 8. Okay? Um, and once he's gone, it says that the one horn is replaced by four horns, none of them living up to the power of the first. And uh, Alexander the Great's kingdom is, in fact, divided up among four leading generals. And uh, they'll control these portions of the territory None of which, uh, none of whom, with the same power and strength as Alexander. Anything else you want to say about Alexander, about the goat and the horn, or the four horns from the vision here? Yes. You know that you know what a goat is right, Mike. Come on. As a fan of Dirk Nowitzki, you know you're yeah. Yeah. yeah the greatest of all time. I thought if anybody you know. It's not blasphemous to say so. If anybody could wear the title, the greatest of all time, Alexander the Great. I mean, he's, you know. But yeah, it was a, it was, it's, called a, it's called a play on words, Mike. It's this thing where you, you kind of use a word one way, but the word also has a different meaning that means something else. That's like, if you get it, then it's... Yeah. A joke is always so much funnier when you have to explain it, you know. Or, or explain that you, you actually knew that you were making the joke. Okay. Uh, so here again, same map. Um, this map I like because it shows in the red outline, which goes a little bit farther than the colors, the, the extent of Alexander's reach, even into India there. Um, but then you see the four uh, kingdoms after Alexander, the Seleucids here, uh, the Ptolemies in Egypt, and then the other two that don't play as much into the story as uh, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies do in the book of Daniel. Uh, but the little horn I want to talk about, um, and that comes kind of after the four horns. There's another horn that comes along. Okay? Um, and some of the stuff that it says about the little horn, even the vision, is a little bit confusing. Okay? Um, it talks about, uh, in verse 9, that this horn became exceedingly great. So we've seen that language before, okay? The the animals, the horns are great. They're powerful, okay? We've seen that. But it says in verse 9 that this horn came toward the glorious land. What are we uh, assuming or uh, theorizing that the glorious land would be? Maybe you said the beautiful land. Anybody? Anybody? Take a wild guess. Well, so what the beautiful land, so this little horn comes towards the beautiful land or the glorious land. Yeah, so there are other passages in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 3 being one of them, that refer to the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, as the beautiful land, the glorious land. So we're going to uh, pick up on that language and say that it is the the land of Israel uh, or of Judah, okay? And uh, I think that's just reinforced in the vision by the fact that this horn uh, has something to do with taking away, in verse 11, the regular burnt offerings, okay? Uh, That's the same, again, same language would be used back in like Exodus or Leviticus to talk about the daily sacrifices that were made at the temple. So this little horn is going to come up against uh, the beautiful land, the, the land of the people of God, He's going to stop the daily offerings or the the regular burnt offerings and overthrow the sanctuary. Okay, he's going to throw truth to the ground, and he is going to uh, raise him, excuse me, raise himself up in pride, uh, even to the level of being a god. So again, some of the stuff we have seen before, we've talked about it in Daniel several times 
about a leader who comes along and makes himself out to be greater than he is, makes himself out to be in the place of God, exalting himself to the heavens. But there is something uh, here particular about the opposition that this horn, this leader, ruler, uh, brings against the people of God. Um, And I don't feel terrible rushing through some of this because it's all going to come back up in much more detail in chapters 10 and 11. Okay, Um, so we can wait on that. But this is a reference, the first of uh, a reference in the book of Daniel, there will be more, to Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV. And he is, uh, remember that map of the Seleucid uh, Empire here, or, or dynasty, okay? In the aftermath of Alexander's kingdom divided up, years later, we have Antiochus IV coming along, and uh, he starts his reign in 175, about halfway through his reign, He turns his cruelty against the Jews in Jerusalem. Maybe you're familiar with some of these stories. We can tell more of them as we go farther into the book. But he becomes uh, the infamous villain uh, in intertestamental history uh, for the Jews. He offers pigs on the altar in uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, It's actually interesting. We talk about the Day of Atonement on Sunday and the the purifying of the sanctuary with the blood of the. So he took pig guts and sprinkled them all over uh, the temple okay, to just completely defile uh, this holy place of the Jews. Uh, one writing says that he would murder those who he found with copies of the law. Uh, he would throw truth to the ground, is the phrase that's used in Daniel chapter 8. But what's interesting is that you, in this chapter here, uh, you have multiple uh, kind of references one in verse 12, and then another one in verse 23, where it says in verse 12 that this is going to happen because of transgression. And then in verse 23, it says that this is going to happen when the transgressors have reached their limit. Okay? And so you might ask the question, well, wh- whose transgression, whose sin, uh, whose transgression is bringing this uh, kind of horrible um, you know, attack against the Jews? Um, and I'm going to suggest that it uh, would be the Jews themselves. It would be because of their own sin, because of their own transgression. Now, there, we could talk about it more as we go. There may be a case to be made for their transgression, uh, not necessarily against God, but against you know, the, the people ruling over them, okay? um, the Greek government. Um, but I, I think we're seeing a situation here in which these are not necessarily innocent sufferers. Okay? This is a, a horrible thing that's brought on because of their own rebellion. Okay? Um, but uh, it's not going to be forever. So in, in, in the vein of the you know, time, times, and half a time that we saw in chapter 7, that we said it was around three and a half years, this may be a similar thing uh, in verse 13 and 14. One angel says to another, Sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? Uh, how long is this going to happen, right? Uh, this is so horrible. Even the, the heavenly beings themselves are saying, how long is this going to be allowed to go on? And uh, the answer is for 2,300 evenings and mornings. So most people have taken that to mean like each sacrifice, the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice, which would mean uh, it's cut that in half. So what, 1,150 days. Right, because each sacrifice, morning, evening, is one. Um, and so uh, that's a, not quite three and a half years. It's three years and a couple months. Uh, but people have tried, not really with much success, to find significance to the literal number. So we're going to do like we did before and say this is likely just symbolic of this is not forever. It's not even three and a half. Right Before it was the saints would be given over for three and a half times. So, you know, half of seven, not a, not a, not a, uh, this is not a forever thing. Here, this is not even that. This is, this is a temporary thing that the people will experience, okay? Um, and that's spelled out more in the interpretation of the dream, sorry, of the vision, uh, when it says that he will, you know, with cunning, uh, he, he cause fearful destruction, destroy mighty men, make war on the saints, right, make himself in the place of the prince of princes, right? Rebelling even against God. Um, and so it's likely begin because of this that Daniel is so frightened and sick at the end of the vision. Okay, um, I'll let you choose. So pick off the board if you want to uh, offer a response here. Um, but 
The question we have here, is Daniel 8 the same message as the rest of the book? Is it a different message than the rest of the book? Uh, and what, what should we take from Daniel chapter 8 here uh, as, as our response? Let's just do the first two. Um, what about Daniel 8 is similar in terms of message to what we've seen up to this point? Chapter 7. Chapter 8. It's the vision to Daniel, and it's more detailed, and it's actually more troubling. These are both Daniel's visions. Now, that's different from the beginning of the book in chapter 2 when Nebuchadnezzar saw the dream. Right. Seven to the end is all Daniel's visions okay. that he is seeing and then having interpreted for him. Um, and he's disturbed by both of them. It'd be hard to, you know, see uh, which one he's more disturbed by. But again, that is a difference. Even you know, Daniel wasn't sick after Nebuchadnezzar's dream was explained. Okay? But he sees these, he, it makes him sick. So, and we'll, maybe we'll do this on next week. Patty says it, it, it lines up with the other kind of, uh, you know, uh, images or visions of successive kingdoms. Okay, so we'll, we'll put all that together maybe next week. And in general, like a chapter 2 in the statue or chapter 7 in the beast, what's the point that's supposed to be made from those uh, visions of, of successive kingdoms? What's the point that is trying to be get, got across here? Yeah, so if Patty says God coming at the end, which is, uh, you know, oftentimes the way it does work out. But if nothing else, God rules in the kingdoms of man, right? It's the kingdoms of earth pass away one by one. It shall stand. The kingdom of, of earth, or sorry, kingdom of heaven, it shall stand. Um, and Daniel 8 continues some of that. We'll just wrap up here and start with this next week. But remember that chapter 8 to 12, we're back at, in Hebrew, and we'll just kind of tease this and then pick up with it next week. That there does seem to be, although the God rules in the kings of man is going to continue as a theme through the rest of the book, we start to kind of center in more so on the role that God's people will play in all of this. Um, and even the trouble that they're going to face and the way that God will preserve them. Um, and Daniel 8 does seem to focus more on that than, uh, than other chapters have. So we'll pick up in chapter 9 next week uh, and do read it ahead of time um, and be ready to discuss. Most of chapter 9 is fairly easy to understand. And then the last paragraph, you will not understand uh, much, because I don't understand much. But maybe by next Wednesday, we'll understand more.